evening. No, good afternoon, Charlotte Villains. Um, I'm here for one reason, that is I am a celebrity, you see. Uh, but I'm a celebrity who's fascinated in what these guys do. And uh, I think that they're dealing with the most interesting things that you can possibly deal with. And uh, they're here to tell you about some of them today. Um, I don't know their, their labels, so they should, uh, I think they should just explain to me. I mean, starting with uh, Bruce, Bruce Grace, who are you anyway? I'm Professor... Is this on? No, but just keep talking okay. anyway. <laughs> I'm Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at UVA and former director of the Division of Perceptual Studies. Neurobehavioral Sciences. Sciences. What the hell is that? <laughs> I'm going to let Ed handle that. Okay. Oh, all right. Okay, let's find it. Then we got Jim Tucker. Yes, I'm <clears throat> Jim Tucker. I'm a, a child psychiatrist at the Division of Perceptual Studies, and I'm the current director. Okay, Emily Kelly. Yeah, I'm Emily Kelly, and um, I'm research Hang on, there's something wrong with the mic, it's Emily. Is this on? No? No. There's always a trouble with mics, yeah. don't worry. Particularly in the afternoon. You'd never get a microphone to work in the afternoon. So there's a nice embarrassing pause now, but if we don't get embarrassed, take, you won't. Here, you I'll see? take this one. Okay, I'm Emily Kelly, and I'm a research assistant professor in the same division of perceptual studies. And Kim Pemberthy. Kim Pemberthy. Yes. Pemberthy. I am not British, I'm American. I'm a clinical psychologist in the Division of Perceptual Studies, and I am currently being blinded by that light, so um, forgive me if I'm squinting at you. I'm not winking, I promise. Thank you. Ed, Ed Kelly. I'm Emily's husband, and also a professor in, at DOPS and an experimental psychologist. So uh, we're going to. Still, the chairs are excellent, aren't they? They've got really, really good chairs together here, and they put them, they, they've spaced them nicely, too. So, <laughs> The thing about tonight, you see, when I'm talking to an audience, I usually love to have some idea of what the audience is like. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, what you know and what you're not likely to know, what's likely to make you cross and what's likely to make you interested. But with you lot, I haven't the slightest idea whether you were very open to these ideas or convinced that there's something going on that the materialist, reductionist scientists don't think is possible, or whether you are here to shoot us down in flames. But anyway, it's going to be, it's going to be great fun. Um, I think we should just start with Bruce. Bruce, tell us what you're doing at the moment. What are you looking at? What are you trying to find out about? Thank you, John. Uh, thinking more clearly than ever before, while your heart has stopped and there's no blood going to your brain. Looking down and seeing your body on the operating table and noticing details, unexpected details, that your surgeon later verifies for you meeting deceased loved ones, family and friends, who you thought were still alive, meeting deceased people who you don't know, but later recognize from family photos. All these are things that happen in some near-death experiences that may have some bearing on the question of whether we survive death of the body, which is our topic for tonight. Is it possible that our consciousness or our mind survives bodily death. There's a wide range of human experiences that suggest this is exactly the case. Near-death experiences occur to us when we're on the threshold of death, and therefore they raise the possibility that they may teach us something about what happens after death. Now, I've been collecting and analyzing near-death experiences for more than 40 years, and I have detailed information about more than 1,000 of these cases. Each one is unique, filtered through the individual's background and personality. But there are some features that they all share in common. And some of these common features have an important bearing on the question of whether we survive death and whether some part of us does, and if so, what, what part is that? 
One of these features that may have some bearing on the question of survival is enhanced mental functioning, thinking clearer than ever, seeing more vividly, forming more detailed memories at a time when your brain is seriously impaired. Now, how is that possible? It seems to defy common sense, and yet it happens. James was a 25-year-old nurse who got deeply depressed and decided to end his life. He took some medications from the hospital where he worked, took an overdose, and lay down on his bed expecting to die. He didn't. In fact, he became sicker and sicker, very nauseous with painful stomach cramps, and decided maybe he better call for some help. So he roused himself, tried to get out of bed, and get to a telephone. But by this time, the drugs had kicked in and were making him very unsteady. He had trouble standing, trouble walking. Not only that, but the drugs were making him hallucinate. And he was seeing little people all around his bed, making it hard for him to get to the telephone. At this point, he told me, he drew up out of his body and was several feet above his body and behind it, thinking very clearly. And he looked down at his body, staggering, staggering around, looking very confused. He remembered being in the body and hallucinating. But from where he was, up above, he couldn't see these little people. Now that convinced James that his mind and his body were not the same thing. And it suggests that I need to think about that also. Are they the same thing? Another feature common to NDEs that makes us question whether we survive is seeing things accurately from some visual perspective not in the body. This too defies common sense. How can you see if you're not in the body? And yet it happens. Al was a 55-year-old truck driver who went to the emergency room with irregular heartbeat. In the, opera, in the emergency room, during diagnostic testing, his heart condition deteriorated rapidly, and he was rushed to the operating room for what eventually became quadruple bypass surgery. In the middle of this operation, he felt himself rising up out of his body and floating weightless above it. He looked down and, to his surprise, saw himself there lying on the table with a sheet over his body. And he saw his surgeon down there looking very perplexed. And as Al described it, his surgeon was flapping his arms as if he was trying to fly. Al didn't understand that. And frankly, I didn't either. I've been working as a doctor for more than 40 years in hospitals. I'd never seen a surgeon do that. I later talked to Al's doctor and asked him about this. And he acknowledged that, yes, he had done that that where he had trained in his home country to be a surgeon, he developed this habit. When he walks into the operating room, all scrubbed in with sterile gloves on, and his residents and, and, attend, and interns, his assistants, are starting the operation, he doesn't want to risk touching something not in the sterile field with his clean hands. So he puts them where he knows they won't touch anything sterile. And then he instructs his interns here, cut over there, pull back over there. So what Al thought was trying to fly was just instructing his assistants on how to do the operation. Now, how did Al know this? How could he see this? This is not an isolated case. A recent survey of more than 100 near-death experiences in which people reported seeing things from an out-of-body perspective found that more than 90% were completely accurate in what they said. Another common feature that people report in NDEs is seeing deceased friends and family. Now, many of us would expect to see deceased loved ones when we die, so that's not so, not so surprising. But sometimes more surprising things happen. For example, people sometimes see deceased loved ones that they thought were still alive. Eddie was a nine-year-old boy who was hospitalized in a coma from meningitis. 
And he was in a coma for about 36 hours before his fever finally broke. His family were gathered around him by the bedside all night long. And finally, about 3 a.m., he opened his eyes and excitedly told his parents that he had just been to heaven. And he'd seen his dead grandfather and Auntie Rosa and Uncle Lorenzo. And then he said, and I also saw my sister Teresa, who told me I had to come back. Now, Teresa was his older sister who was in college in Vermont. And as far as anyone knew, was perfectly healthy. Later that morning, when his parents went home, they immediately called the college. And they found that Teresa had, in fact, been killed in a car accident just after midnight. How did Eddie know about that? Jack was a 25-year-old electrical engineer who was hospitalized with pneumonia. One day, as his young nurse, Anita, was fluffing up his pillow, she mentioned to him that this weekend was going to be her 21st birthday, and she was going to be gone for a few days visiting her parents. Shortly after she left, Jack's condition went downhill, and he had trouble breathing. He eventually stopped breathing entirely. He then had a near-death experience in which he saw Nurse Anita. Surprised to see you there, he said, what are you doing here? And she said, I've come to fluff your pillow up one, one more time. And I'd like you to go back and tell my parents that I love them and I'm sorry I wrecked the red sports car. When Jack recovered, he told the nurse about this experience. She started tearing up and left the room immediately. Later, Jack learned that Anita's parents had in fact surprised her with a red sports car for her birthday. And excited to try it out, she raced down the highway and crashed into a concrete barrier, dying instantly. Now, how could Jack know this? How could Eddie know this? How can these things happen? And finally, there are some people in near-death experiences who meet what appear to be deceased people who they don't know. Levi was a 35-year-old man who was born in Holland, who had a cardiac arrest, his heart stopped, and he had a near-death experience, saw his grandmother who had died, and then saw a man who didn't recognize, but who looked at him very lovingly. He didn't know who this was, didn't know what to make of it, so he didn't talk to anybody about this. 10 years later, when his, grand when his mother was on her deathbed, she confessed to him that her husband, who had raised Levi as his father, was not, in fact, his biological father. Levi's biological father was, in fact, a Jewish man who had been captured by the Nazis when they came into town, taken to a concentration camp, and never seen again. And then his mother showed Levi a photograph of his father, which he recognized immediately as the man from his near-death experience. So we have in near-death experiences heightened mental thoughts when your brain isn't functioning, we have accurate perceptions from outside the body. We have meeting with deceased loved ones who you didn't know had died. We have deceased meetings with loved ones who you didn't know, period. And we don't have a good physical explanation for this. So all these things should make us think about, is there something about us that survives the bodily death? And if so, what is that thing? Marvelous. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, when I started getting interested in all this nonsense some uh, time ago, um, I, I was reading a lot about out-of-body experiences, which are obviously not necessarily connected with dying. Right. Now, you don't mention them. Is there any reason for that? Uh, because they're very similar, right? They are. They are. An out-of-body experience where you feel you're leaving your physical body is something that often happens as part of a near-death experience but it can also happen under other circumstances as well. And the reason I chose just to talk about the near-death experiences is because we have some other information about what's going on with the body at that time. 
So it's a little easier to study what's going on with it. Because it fascinates me. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. In the uh, out-of-body experiences, there's almost a better chance of being able to check what happened. You know, people, I know a woman on the operating table, bad car accident, who said she left her body and went into the waiting room and saw her parents there. Right. And uh, her brother was there and her sister arrived late and Gilligan's Island was on the, on the television. And when she recovered consciousness and started talking to her family, of course, it, it, it scared them and she stopped talking about yeah, it. Yeah. But those kind of things are particularly fascinating because, again, how did they get the knowledge? You know? Right, right. Uh, go on. What were you going to say? I was going to say that, that what makes the near-death experience, out-of-body experience, so much more interesting to me is that we know that the brain is not functioning very well with this, when this is happening. Uh. So we know that it is more than just the brain imagining this. It's something that is happening when the brain is not functioning right. Right, good. Jim, Yes. Jim Tucker, what are you gonna tell us about? Well, um, I'm gonna talk about children who report memories of past lives. And uh, this was work that has been going on at UVA for uh, over 50 years. Uh, Division of Perceptual Studies officially started in 1967, so we've now celebrated 50 years. But Ian Stevenson, who started our division, uh, actually started studying these cases in the early 1960s. <clears throat> and we have continued on uh, even after he is no longer with us. Uh, and we've now studied over 2,500 cases uh, from around the world, basically, of, of young children who report a memory of a past life. And what they typically do is describe a recent, ordinary life uh, that often ended violently or ended when the person was young. And uh, Ian spent uh, many, many hours and traveled many miles trying to find these cases and mostly found them in Asia because in cultures with the belief in reincarnation, people talk about them more. Uh, but now... Uh, with the internet and, and with people knowing about our work, we hear from American families all the time. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples, and, and this first one is one that we talked about yesterday. So uh, there's, uh, we got a letter one day from this mother in Oklahoma, and she said that she and her husband were just ordinary people. Uh, her husband was a police officer, and her, uh, she worked in the county clerk's office. Uh, but for the last year, their five-year-old boy, Ryan, had talked about a past life in Hollywood. And he would cry about uh, Hollywood wanting his mom to take him back there. So to try to help him kind of process this stuff, she decided to go to the public library and check out some books on Hollywood. And they were looking through one one day when they came to a picture from an old movie called Night After Night. And Ryan pointed to one of the men in the picture and said, uh, hey, Mama, that's George. We did a picture together. And he pointed to another one of the men and said, and Mama, that's me. I found me. Well, the first person he pointed to was George Raft, uh, who was quite a well-known actor uh, back in his day. Uh, but the other man he pointed to that he said he had been was an extra with no lines in the movie. So Ryan's mom wrote to me to see if I could help figure out who this guy was. Uh, so I went to Oklahoma and I talked with the parents, I talked with Ryan, and then afterwards, um, as we were trying to figure out who this person was, Ryan's mom was emailing me, sometimes on a daily basis, with all these details that Ryan was giving about his past life. Uh, he was describing quite a life that, to be honest, I thought was rather unlikely for an extra with no lines in a movie. <laughs> um, <clears throat> eventually, with the help of a Hollywood archivist, we were able to figure out who this guy was. This archivist, she went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, got all the materials on the movie night after night, and there was one picture that included an identification of this guy, and he was a fellow named Marty Martin, uh, who died in 1964. Um, 
it turned out that Marty Martin did have quite a life. So Ryan said how he had danced on stage in New York and uh, Marty Martin danced on Broadway. Ryan said he then went to Hollywood and, and worked in the movies, which Marty Martin did, uh, mostly working on dancing in movies. Um, he said that he then worked for an agency, and Marty Martin started a successful talent agency. Uh, in fact, Ryan said it was an agency where people changed their names, and then it, Marty Martin worked at a talent agency. Um, Ryan said how he had seen the world from big boats and talked about visiting Paris. Uh, Marty Martin and his wife went to Europe on the Queen Mary, and we have pictures of them in Paris. Ryan said he had a big house with a swimming pool, uh, which Marty Martin did, and Ryan said that the street address had the word rock or mount in it, and uh, Marty Martin lived on North Roxbury. Uh, Ryan also said one time that he didn't understand why God would let you get to be 61 and then make you come back again as a baby. <laughs> um, <clears throat> which is sort of an interesting philosophical question on its own, but um, we got Marty Martin's death certificate, which said that he was 59. Uh, but then I talked with his daughter and with his stepson, who both said, no, he was actually 61. So I looked into it, and I found three census records, two marriage listings, and a passenger list that all gave ages for Marty Martin that meant, in fact, he was 61 when he died and not 59. Um, and all together, we uh, verified that over 50 of Ryan's statements matched with Marty Martin's life. Um, another example that I will tell you about is a recent case that I studied, a, a little boy that I'll, I'll call Stephen. Uh, he was also five years old. When he started talking about how he had um, been a soldier who died in a war and that it was in the jungle, and his parents asked him if it was Vietnam, and, and he said yes. And then he gave a last name, which was an unusual last name, and the state where he was from. So his mom went on the Vietnam Memorial website and found that, in fact, there was a soldier uh, killed with that name from that state who had been killed in Vietnam. She pulled up pictures of a bunch of the, the people who had been killed, and when she got to the one of him, uh, the little boy said, that's me. So she didn't do any more research. She wrote to me at, to let me know what, what Stephen was saying. Uh, so then I did do a little more research online. I, I got a subscription to an um, online newspaper collection, did a little sort of detective work. And when I went to see the family, I brought some pictures with me. Now, I didn't want to overwhelm a five-year-old little boy with uh, lineups of pictures. So what I did was show him pairs of pictures where one of the pictures was from this man's life and the other one wasn't. So for instance, I showed him a picture of the man's high school and then a different high school and he picked the correct one. Um, I showed him pictures of two houses and again he picked the correct one. So then after that visit, um, I continued to do online detective work. I also wrote to the man's sister, and I heard back from his niece, the, the sister's daughter, and she sent me some family photos. So then I sent some more pairs of pictures to Stephen's mom, and the good thing about these tests, when, when she showed them to Stephen, was that she didn't know which was the right picture either. So there was no chance that he was picking up on cues from anything as, as he looked at the pairs. Now, altogether, we showed him eight pairs of pictures. Uh, a couple of them he didn't make a choice on, uh, but for the others, he was six out of six. Now, along with the knowledge that these kids seem to have about a past life, um, a lot of them also show emotions and behaviors that seem linked. Um, so I mentioned Ryan crying about Hollywood, and, and we hear this all the time of, of kids sometimes crying on a daily basis about missing their family, uh, begging to be taken to their family. Uh, for the kids who, where the previous person died violently, uh, a lot of them will have nightmares repeatedly about that death. So there's an, a well-known American case where a little boy uh, from the time of his second birthday 
started having horrible nightmares multiple times a week of a plane crash. And um, as the case developed, it became clear that, that he had memories of, of a particular pilot who was killed during World War II. Also with the violent death cases, a lot of them will, um, the kids will show phobias, uh, intense fear toward the mode of death. Uh, and, and this seems particularly true in, in drowning cases where these kids will, will just um, be intensely afraid of, of being put in water. And also, there are cases where, and, and Ian Stevenson was really interested in these and, and studied several hundred of them. Uh, there are cases where the children will be born with birthmarks or even birth defects that match wounds, uh, usually fatal wounds, on the body of the previous person. So, for instance, there was one little boy where the previous person had been uh, killed by a shotgun blast to the side of his head. Uh, the man's neighbor said he mistook his neighbor for a rabbit and um, shot him in the side of the head uh, with a shotgun. And then this little boy was born with this, just a stump for an ear and an underdeveloped right side of his face. Um, Ian also listed 18 cases where the children were born with two birthmarks, ones that matched both the entrance wound and the exit wound on the body of the previous person. So with all of this, uh, these cases, you know, I think provide pretty good evidence that something is going on, that there is this carryover from the past life. Um, but I, I have never argued that these cases mean that we all reincarnate, that we all come back here. Uh, in fact, you can make the case that these are exceptional cases because the previous person typically died violently or died young. Uh, came back quickly with intact memories. So maybe the, the usual pattern for most of us is not that we come back here, but we may have all kinds of different types of existence uh, after we die. Uh, but regardless, I do think that these cases contribute, along with near-death experiences and the other things, to a good body of evidence that there are times where consciousness does survive after the body dies, and in, and in these cases attaches to a to new life and, and then has a new life here. So that's what I think. Of. Well, I, I'm fascinated by the idea that they might happen to some people, and there's a correlation with bad endings, bad deaths, isn't there? But that's not always the case, because in this uh, one with the agent, um, there's a 40-year gap between the guy dying and the, uh, the child being born. So do you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, and, and with that World War II case, and there's a 50-year gap oh, there. Yeah. But the average interval is only um, four and a half years. So it's, it's typical that they come back very quickly. I mean, there are always exceptions pretty much to anything. Uh, but it does seem that for many of the cases, it's a, you can make a reasonable argument that the previous person had sort of unfinished business and that it might have led them to stay attached to this realm or, or this world and then be reborn and, and start another life. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, Emily, darling, give us, a, give us a picture of what you're interested in. Okay, well, um, I hope this new one works all right. Is it, you all can hear me? Okay, good. Um, Several years ago, I did a survey um, asking people whether they had ever experienced any of a number of the kinds of things that we're interested in. Um, Near-death experiences, past life memories, out-of-body experiences, apparitions, that sort of thing. And I learned about a lot of really interesting experiences that way. But maybe the most interesting thing I learned was that the single most often reported experience was being at the bedside of a dying person who seemed to be talking with and seeing someone who was not physically present. Usually someone who had died earlier, such as a spouse, a parent, a sibling. Um, there's been virtually no systematic research done on these so-called deathbed visions, and so I really had no expectation about how common they might be. 
But in addition to the survey, I've also over the years talked to a lot of hospice workers who tell me that these experiences in fact are quite common. Um, in fact, one hospice doctor told me that he has learned that when such visions start, it's time to call the family and make sure they're there. Um, in addition to the dying person, um, sometimes people at the bedside will also have unusual experiences. Um, and sometimes shared by the dying person, sometimes not shared by the dying person. And this actually happened in my own family. Um, my grandmother had had a stroke and she was at home dying. She was in a coma and um, her son-in-law was sitting beside the bed with her. He himself was a physician. And all of a sudden he saw standing at the foot of the bed my grandfather who had died about seven years previously with his arms outstretched to my grandmother and calling out her name. And a few moments later, my grandmother died. Um, another kind of experience that actually has been studied quite a lot over the years is something that we call crisis cases. And these are experiences that happen not at the bedside of a dying person, but some distance away, and often quite a long distance away. Um, um, a typical experience of this kind is one in which a person hasn't sees a vision, sees an apparition of a particular person, and then later learns that that person had in fact died at about the time of the vision. Um, there have, over the years, there have been reported literally thousands of these experiences, reported and investigated, thousands of these experiences. And I learned about a few more in my survey, some very interesting ones, but um, one in particular that I found very interesting was not an actual vision, but involved a physical event. And I wanted to just read to you the description that the woman who had the experience sent to me, because um, she expressed it a lot better than I could. Um, the day my grandma died, I was headed out to work about 3 a.m. I knew she was very sick, and I had planned to fly to New Jersey later that day to see her because I knew time was short. As I went to put the key in the car, I felt this overwhelming presence, and all of a sudden, my driver window shattered, and I thought to myself, Grandma just died. As I got to work, I could not shake the feeling of Grandma right next to me. The phone call came. Grandma died at the same time I felt her and, that the, window sh and the window shattered. I felt this was Grandma's way of telling me she's gone. Now, I don't have any idea how often car windows shatter spontaneously, but I don't think we can attribute this experience to chance. <laughs> There's still another kind of experience that we are particularly interested in, in learning about, and we call these um, revival cases or terminal lucidity cases. And these are, um, involve people who are suffering from Alzheimer's, or other forms of dementia, and who seem to recover their mental faculties shortly before they die. Um, again, I learned about some of these in my survey. One woman in particular wrote to me about her grandmother. Um, her grandmother had had Alzheimer's, and for quite some time she had not recognized anyone. But shortly before she died, she seemed to recover, and the woman actually had a conversation with her a normal conversation in which they sort of went over family affairs, family events, things that had been happening. The woman told me, she said, it felt like I was talking to Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> Another um, experience like this that was a similar one that was reported was actually reported in a special issue of Time magazine that came out several years ago. It was reported by a physician named Scott Haig. And um, this special issue of time was devoted to talking about the mind-brain problem, mind-brain issues. And nearly all of the issue, or really all of the issue, was um, taking the position that um, is the predominant position in science today, which is that um, the brain produces the mind, produces consciousness, and that therefore consciousness is totally and wholly dependent on the brain. Well, Dr. Haig, 
wrote a little essay that took quite a different position. And he, what he did was he described a case of his, a patient of his named David, who was, had brain cancer that had literally been eating away much of David's brain so that toward the end of his life, he was completely unresponsive. Um, one night, Dr. Haig went home and he knew that David was gonna die that night. And he did, he died that night. Um, when Dr. Haig got back to the hospital the next morning, the nurse came up to him and said, um, you know, last night David woke up and was able to talk to his family before he died. Um, now these experiences, these sort of revival cases, I think are extremely rare. We have, we know about a fair number of them, but I think they are extremely rare, but they're also extremely important because they suggest that as the brain is shutting down, the mind is somehow being freed. Um, as Dr. Haig put it, he said, David's, that night, David's mind somehow broke through his diseased brain so that he could say goodbye to his family. Um, as I said earlier, there's been practically no systematic research done on these sort of deathbed visions and, and revival cases and cases of this sort. Um, there's been a, a doctor in, um, a physician in the UK has started doing some research over there in connection with hospice and nursing homes over there. But there's still so much that we, just basic information that we don't know about these experiences. Um, things like how often do they happen? Um, to whom do they happen? Under what circumstances do they happen? Um, one of the most important questions that we know very little about is um, what's the relationship between drugs and these deathbed visions? Um, we do have some preliminary information that suggests that drugs may actually inhibit the experience and not cause them. But again, this is something we just know very little about at this point. So we here at our group wants to start a study here in Charlottesville. Um, and I'm now in the process of looking for funds to support this, but as, I don't know how many of you all were here last night, but as John said last night, funds for this kind of research ain't easy to find. <laughs> so, but I'm optimistic that we'll be able to find it and maybe in a few years, we can come back to the TomTom Tom Festival and give you an update on what we found. Thank you. Um, this is fascinating to me at any rate, and clearly is to you. Um, now we've had three people talking, I think it might be fun just to open it up to the audience for a bit before we come back to Kim. Otherwise, the, uh, just the repetition of, of, of the, the uh, shape of this might become, uh, help, uh, cause people to lose their concentration. Um, do we have some questions? There's a microphone there. Um, we've got people, I think. Yes, yes, sir, can you stand up and shout? Oh, well, that's good. Is this working? Yeah, cool. So this is more of a philosophical question than it is maybe a scientific one, but let's say based on the premises of the stories that you guys have told, we believe that there is some form of experience or life after death. What then becomes, I don't know, the point of a corporeal existence versus whatever else you guys have experienced or seeing people experience after death? Now, Ed. Did you hear that? I did not, actually. I'm sorry, yeah. do you mind again? I'm more deaf than you are. <laughs> yeah. I think the shorter way of saying that is if we have life after death, what is the point of life itself, right? <laughs> Thanks for the easy question. That was... Can we postpone that? There's a softball for you, Ed. He's the one that did the meaning of life. Why don't you ask him? <laughs> Um, I, I remember my good friend Peter Cook, who was a, a, a genius and a comedian. He was much more concerned with whether there was sex after death. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting question. Well, I mean, what is the point of any of it? 
Do you see what I mean? Anything you can ask of that at any point. But the point is, this is um, this may be the way it is, at least for some people. And if anything's accomplished this, uh, this afternoon, I hope it's that uh, that people are curious, because many people in the scientific community don't have a theory, so they say it couldn't have happened, which is not really terribly impressive. Um, <laughs> Stan, Stan Groff uh, gave, uh, recounted an experience to uh, Carl Sagan, at the end of which Sagan said it couldn't have happened, you know? And that's an odd, what can I say, defense. So what I'm hoping we'll do today is not convert you to some new uh, situation, but cause you to be more curious about this kind of stuff, just so that you begin to read the literature, because um, one woman who was a very high, had a very high uh, position in the American statistical community, she was a famous statistician, she, uh, she pointed out how the amount of uh, evidence there is for this, um, it, was, it was unarguable from a stat statistician's point of view that uh, the odds were that this, there's a great deal of truth in this stuff. And she commented that the extraordinary thing is that many of the people who felt strongly that it was imaginary or, or something to do with fraud or something like that, 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 that they hadn't read any of the literature. And yet they still felt they were in a position to say, this is nonsense, it couldn't have happened. So all I'm saying to you is start reading the literature because after a time it's very, very hard, I think, for me to accept anything other than the idea that something goes on after we die. And if, if uh, quantum physics is as incomprehensible as it is, and that's the best way we have at the moment of, of uh, describing reality, I don't see that life after death could be any simpler than that. So I think the key is, does it happen? Um, not whether do we have a theory to explain it. Hmm? The lady there, the blue shirt. Hi, first I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Cleese for coming to our small town. Get on with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is a small town, I've lived in a lot of big cities. Um, but each of you so far have spoken about very segmented things. Do you find, have you encountered people who have multiple experiences? Mm. Because I've experienced some rather strange things in my life, but one is I tend to get visits from other people's relatives when they pass, and I'll know about it before I get the phone call, before they get the phone call. Um, I've had family members that experienced, I have experienced the, um, my step-grandmother died of glioblastoma, and she had the clarity uh, before she passed away, and she was able to have a conversation. My roommate, uh, some years later, had the same experience with her father. Uh, very severe case of glioblastoma in both cases, both died in six months, and they had no cognition whatsoever. And her father woke up, was able to have a conversation with her and her brother. And we were all adults when, in both of these cases, and it was very clear. And he was able to kind of rectify some things and just kind of say goodbye peacefully but I feel like I've been exposed to a lot of these kinds of things. And I'm wondering, do you find that there are certain people who are sensitives or where there are multiple experiences? Yeah, there definitely are. Um, and it, it differs with, with some of these different experiences. I know with near-death experiences, people who have near-death experiences often do not have a history of unusual events. But after the NDE, after the near-death experience, they're opened up and the door doesn't close. And they often have many experiences after that. I think it's somewhat different with the reincarnation memories. Well, it is, although there do seem to be some families where the reincarnation memories actually is almost like a genetic thing. Um, but to, to answer your question, I think in general, there are people who report a number of different kinds of experiences. And, and you know, some people seem to be basically sort of more psychic than others, and they can have all different kinds of things, so that's how I would answer. I will say, I think, um, I think Ed can speak to this better than I can, but there is a fair amount of experimental evidence um, showing that people who do well in experimental tasks have certain personality profiles. 
So in addition to, the, to what you're pointing out, that people do have, I mean, you, having just one-off experience is not very common. Most people do have multiple ones. But I think there is a definite personality profile of some sort that, that contributes to that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Gentleman in the green shirt. Yeah, my question um, is related to um, past death experiences. Uh, my mother always um, had a, a near phobia regarding necklaces, turtleneck sweaters, and always jokingly said, I think I was strangled in a past life. Um, my father, of course, told her that it was probably more likely in her future than in her <laughs> past. Um, <laughs> he, he was a character. Um, <laughs> But I guess I have two questions. One, I mean, it sounds like that's very typical to things that you've heard elsewhere, and I would like to reassure her of that, and also reassure her that if that's the case, maybe she's safe um, in the future. Well, as far as, so you're suggesting, or she's suggesting that as a memory of a past life that then led to this unexplained phobia, basically. And... Um, that's certainly possible. I mean, with, with our child cases, typically the kids lose the memories and lose the fears as they get older. But there are certainly exceptions. And, you know, the question is how much do we generalize from our cases where people have actual intact memories of a past life compared to people who don't? So, you know, with an unexplained phobia, we certainly can't say for sure that it's connected to a past life experience, but it's plausible that it could be. And, and as long as she doesn't have other precognitive abilities, you know, hopefully she can be rest assured that she's not actually seeing her future, but more likely to be seeing her past. Uh, the lady um, in the red dress. Um, I have A little an... closer to the microphone. Sorry, I know it's hard to hear through this. That's okay. um, I have an extremely rare form of paroxysmal dyskinesia, if you're familiar with that. Um, basically, I have what appears to be grand mal seizure, but I, rain, I retain consciousness. And one thing that I've noticed in that is um, I can be completely paralytic for up to 16 hours, but my friends have found that they can snap me out of it by being wrong and making me angry. <laughs> so I was... Uh, I'm an English literature major. They'll start talking about... Uh, Baconism and things like that, and yeah. Uh, uh, the so, English majors get it. Yeah, yeah, the English majors get it. Um, or you know, saying that uh, early modern literature is not relevant to modern life. But I've noticed that uh, what you were saying about the mind when the brain is um, not fully functional, because I've probably experienced neural storm more closely than any person with a functioning brain at this point has. So with the mind being able to get me out of a paralytic state, is, what would you think about that? <laughs> Who wants to answer that? Ed? Well, um... <laughs> That's one kind of example that we're definitely interested in. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the stuff we study, cases, uh, near-death cases in particular, we have a lot of that occur under conditions like deep general anesthesia or cardiac arrest, heart stopping, which basically abolishes the conditions that most neuroscientists think are required for anybody to have a conscious experience. And yet people are not only reporting experiences, but the most intense transformative experiences of their entire lives. So this is another example of that sort of thing. Okay, Thank let's you. have uh, one more from the lady in pink. Hi. Um, so with the children who have these memories from a previous life, and children stop remembering things, you know, they don't remember things before they're, what, seven or eight or something like that. Um, do they lose this recollection? And also, I'm curious, the families of the dead people, do they engage with them and really relate to them after this all kind of comes out? Well, most of the, well, almost all of the kids stop talking about the past life as they get older, and, and usually around the time or six or seven. And many of them seem to lose the memories. And, and as you say, that's when all children lose memories of their early childhood. Um, but we have learned that a fair number of them, if you go back, if you wait long enough and interview them when they're adults, they say they do still have some memories. So they have stopped talking about it, 
gone to school, tried to be normal or whatever, but it may be that some of those memories still stay. Now, in a lot of cases, the two families do meet, and it varies the amount of connection. Some of them establish a big connection, and they, the previous family will visit the child or vice versa uh, repeatedly as, as the child gets older. Sometimes, actually, the previous family develops more of an attachment for the child than the child has for that family. Um, often with the kids, once they meet the previous family, see the previous place, uh, they see that their memories are validated, but they also see that time has moved on, and it seems that the emotional intensity from their standpoint lessens, even though for the previous family, of course, it may get more intense as they see the child. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, we've got, uh, we won't add any more to this queue. We'll go back uh, to, to Kim and Ed after these. we've done these. Gentlemen, the blue stripes. Hi. Um, as someone that was raised in a fundamentalist family, um, I'm someone that came from a history of, you know, blind belief. I've gone back and forth between uh, both sides. I'm dealing with a lot of skepticism these days. I have two questions. I'm, I'm only going to ask one. Um, and I was, very t I was very torn on which one I wanted to go with because one is very positive. And I'm, I would love to talk with you guys about that more later. We'll but go, right now, we'll give you two. We'll go one, then damn, back really? to you. All right. <laughs> Mr. Please, thank you. You're my hero. Let, you already were. Let's have the positive one first. Okay, you? first. Well, I, I've been working with a theory for a long time, and I just wonder. Uh, I would love to hear your opinion on it. That the idea for life, if if reincarnation is true, or if we are able to live many, many lives is this idea that the only way human beings could ever live together in a perfect after afterlife is if there was such a thing as perfect empathy. And the only way you could ever experience perfect empathy is if you would actually experience what it was like to be everyone else. And I love to think that it's possible that when we become who we are, it's actually just an am amalgamation of every single possible experience. So we're still ourselves, but we still know what it's like to be everyone else. And I just wonder if you guys have talked about that or if you've thought about that. Are you, you tying that to reincarnation? I wasn't clear. I'm sorry? Were you tying that? Um, it, it could be reincarnation. It could be parallel universes. It could be all kinds of different ways that it would all come together. Well, um, you may have a more positive point of view on life than I do, perhaps. But I... I tend to think of it more as just a naturalistic process where consciousness exists and it continues to exist uh, after the physical body and brain die and it continues to have experiences. Um, but it is whether there's sort of an intention to it, there, there is hope that there is the potential for progress. That even if we don't come back with intact memories, hopefully our consciousness or whatever you want to call it is affected and that we do learn, or like you say, we have empathy because we experience different viewpoints. So hopefully through all this course of different lives, um, we do grow and, and make progress. Gentlemen, the white shirt. Mr. Cleese, I've always uh, wanted you to ask me my name so that I could respond by saying, some call me Tim. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I know, I know that the talk is only halfway over, and I don't mean to minimalize or generalize anything, but I'm trying to uh, get a certain grasp on a uh, certain sort of thematic uh, intention for all of your studies. Uh, it, does, it have some, does it have something to do with closure? A lot of what we've been talking about has uh, kind of uh, focused in on a way to um, close the book and all of uh, what everyone else is talking about is um, kind of opening so that there is an opportunity to close the book. And I just wanted some sort of elaboration on that. Ed? You fancy <laughs> that one? <laughs> How about not Ed? I'd uh, rather respond to that, actually, by talking about the two books on the Sounds good. end of the list there. I look forward to it. A little bit. Now, I, I will say, though, that science is not really about closing the book. It's about opening it up mm. and getting more and more better, better questions. I think uh, Woody Allen said, I don't believe in an afterlife, but I am taking a change of underwear. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Gentlemen in blue, you're negative. Wow. Go and I feel spoil the afternoon. I am unworthy, but... Uh, okay, so what I've heard so far, the, the thing that I feel most skeptical about and that's hardest for me to understand is this idea that there's some kind of physical carryover into the next life. I had never heard that before. Um, the idea that something could uh, mentally carry over makes a lot of sense to me, or emotionally. But the idea that you were killed by a gunshot wound and then you're, you're born with birthmarks, I can't even begin to imagine any kind of reason for that or mechanism that would create that. Do you all have any theories for that or any explanation for that? Yeah, and I, I will say um, that was sort of a, a big pill for me to swallow also when I got involved with this work. And <clears throat> we know from other research that sometimes uh, mental images can produce very specific changes in the body. So, for instance, there are cases of uh, in hypnosis where you tell someone you're burning them with a hot poker or whatever, and, and they'll develop a, a burn uh, purely from the mental image of being burned. So, in these cases, I don't think it's literally the physical wound, the shotgun to the head, but it may well be the um, sort of the mental image of that, the mental experience of being killed that is obviously a very strong experience that if the consciousness does continue, it continues with it almost in a PTSD kind of way. And then, um, rather than like hypnosis producing a temporary mark, in these cases, the consciousness, if it does in fact enter a developing fetus, it would then lead to a similar uh, wound that would be permanent on the child, so it wasn't literally the physical injury, but more the, the mental aspect of it that produced the mark. Jim, you, you made an interesting point to me <clears throat> a couple of days ago when you pointed out that it was a very strange way for karma to work, that someone who has been killed seems, the, you know, they're continuing, uh, um, what do we say, their continuing experience um, seems like a punishment for having been killed. Do you want to say something? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of these cases came from places, for instance, with, with uh, Hindu beliefs where karma is a big part of that. And, I mean, karma is certainly a, a more subtle philosophy than, than we often uh, know about. But in any case, the, the idea of of karmic retribution would lead you to think that if somebody's murdered, then the murderer would then be reborn with the injury that he caused. But in fact, that's not what we see. It's, it's the victim uh, that comes back with the wound. So again, it, it seems to be, I would view it as a naturalistic uh, mental pros um, um, experience that, that leads to that. Right. Gentleman in the white shirt. Just a quick comment and a question. The gentleman who first uh, came up and asked, what's the point of it all? Why bother being human? And I'd like to offer that, hmm, maybe the hokey pokey really is what it's all about. <laughs> um, so my question is, uh, were any of you non-believers or highly skeptical before you started this research? And would one or two of you care to comment on what might have changed your minds? Uh, I don't know that we've changed our minds. I think we all are fairly skeptical about these things we're, experience, we're investigating. And it certainly opened our minds to see these things. In fact, one of the most profound things that opened my mind is seeing the way these experiences affect people. Mm. Um, the profound and long-lasting after effects of near-death experiences, for example, uh, persuaded me that these are not a type of mental illness. They're a real event that people are going through. I, Still, I'm very skeptical about how we understand them, what their meaning of it is. Yeah, and uh, I would agree that um, I think we're still skeptics in the sense that every case that I approach, um, I approach in some ways looking for the defects in the case. Um, so, I mean, obviously we're open to this stuff or we wouldn't be devoting much of our lives to it, but it's, I think we do approach it with the scientific point of view that I, speaking for myself, I'm trying to find out for myself what all this means. I'm not trying to convince anyone of a particular religious belief or whatever, but, but just trying to see really where the evidence takes me. Kim. I, I was just going to say, I think we would all raise our hand 
and um, that that's a big part of the scientific approach to it, that we don't come in with our mind already made up, that we really are curious about this. I might add that uh, we're all just uh, poor empirical scientists down in the trenches for the most part and uh, don't claim to have any kind of special expertise about what it might all mean. And we're open to the possibility that it is all about the hokey pokey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it occurs to me that um, when the founder of, of physics, real Niels Bohr, uh, said um, about quantum physics that uh, if, as you approach it, you are not shocked, then you haven't understood it. And trying to understand this, these, these things in, in terms of any kind of physics after Einstein is what, what, why should this be easier to understand? Why, there, why there should, should there be a, a simple explanation if the main description of reality at the moment, which seems to be quantum theory, um, shows um, no relation at all to the life we lead on, on this planet? Do you see what I mean? Lady in the blue, can you get through? The um, near-death experiences that you have um, discussed tonight are seem rather pleasant. Do you have people um, reporting near-death experiences that are not so pleasant? Uh, yes, we do have unpleasant near-death experiences. Um, the ones we've collected uh, a very tiny minority, less than 1%, are unpleasant. However, it's very hard for people to talk about unpleasant experiences. So there may be a lot more than we're aware of. But we have so few that we've been able to study that we can't say with any certainty why some people have unpleasant ones and other people don't. Um, it's certainly not the case that nasty people have unpleasant experiences. I know some quite nasty people who have blissful experiences. <laughs> And there's certainly lots of reports about saints throughout the, the, the ages who have unpleasant experiences. So there's no, there's no simple answer to it. But we are trying to look at that question. Now, this is a bit unfair, but I did say earlier that I wanted to come back to the panel. So you guys are in that order when we restart. Do you, do you see what I mean? But I'm going to go now to Kim. What, what are you interested in? What are you working on? Well, I am the new kid on the block, so I have not been here as long as these folks, and I, I feel very fortunate to be part of this group. I'm a clinical psychologist and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and as part of my work, I see patients, and I do research, and I teach. And a lot of the patients I see that I'm doing psychotherapy on, I also have started doing mindfulness-based therapies and recognizing the impact of the meditation and the mindfulness treatments that I was providing. And the, the positive impact on symptoms was wonderful. However, I kept hearing over and over again from my patients that they were experiencing other things. And so that's where I really began exploring and, and getting interested in what was actually happening and I'll give you an example very quickly. I, I had a gentleman with very severe depression, an attorney, very bright, 52-year-old, had just been left by his wife, very bad alcoholic. He had tried so many times to stop drinking. He had tried so many times to, to stay on his treatment for depression, and he couldn't. And I worked with him to start practicing mindfulness meditation to help reduce the cravings for alcohol. It didn't work, but he kept trying, he kept meditating. And then one day he came to me and he said, I'm not gonna drink again. And I said, okay, sure, all right, that sounds good. Let's, let's, let's keep an eye on this, but I didn't believe him. And he has not had a drink to this day I asked him what happened, and he had what we call clair, a clairaudience experience while he was 
meditating, a voice of a woman came and said, uh, beat him up. I mean, talk about a negative experience. This, this voice told him to, to quit it. What the hell was he doing? He was killing himself. And he said, you know, it sounded like my mother, um, <laughs> but I'm not sure if it was, but he, he said it resonated with him and no one else heard it. It, it wasn't, you know, a, a, a real person. He wasn't delusional, but it worked. He had, he had perceived that this came from somewhere and it worked. And I saw this over and over again in my patients with personality disorders when they would meditate, when they would get in touch with this, this thing, change the state of consciousness. And what I began to realize is that more and more of them were reporting what many of you will know as cities. These are actually to be expected sort of experiences that people have when they're practicing some of these, what are now modern traditions, but come from ancient traditions where this was to be expected, that you would have extraordinary experiences, gifts, and powers. Um, these are things like psychokinesis, where you might be able to influence the environment, physical environment, or what we might call psi, psycho, Psyche, uh, psychic sort of abilities where you might be able to predict something in the future or remember something that you couldn't possibly remember from the distant past. And so the research I am moving into now is really more methodically exploring this. And I'm building on research with my colleague who John also knows, Cassie uh, Veaton at the Noetic Sciences. And uh, she's in California. They did a study that looked at just a survey of 1,100 people or so. And they were meditators who had done some significant meditating. And they asked them about these specific experiences. And it was absolutely astounding. They found over 50% endorsed experiencing some of these things, one or more. I miss that. This is selfish. What did you say? 50% what? 50% reported experiencing some of these cities, some of these ex extraordinary experiences, things like precognition. I mean, I don't know about you, but that is mind-blowing to me. Um, and, and so they followed up with some additional research looking at this. Most of the people, 60%, were significantly impacted by this in a positive way, which again is, is pretty profound. So they didn't say, well, it's no big deal. It was very significant to them psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. So we're building on that research now and looking at can all the things we've talked about here, can we make this happen on purpose? And, and what will that look like? How many people will experience these things? And who experiences them? Are, it, are they certain kinds of personalities? Are they people that need special training? Do you need to be a monk? I hope not. Um, and the idea is, can we access these out-of-body experiences, these phenomenal experiences, and learn from them what we see that these other people have learned? on purpose, and what would that look like to tap into that human ability, that level of consciousness, if we all did that? Wow, I think we, we might have some hope. <laughs> Very good. Very good. I just wanted to comment on one thing before we come to Ed. Um, which is that I was reading something a week ago that suggested that if we could all quieten our minds to the required extent, we could all do this. Now, obviously, maybe the difference is that some of us can quiet our minds better than others. And I tie that in with another idea, which is years ago I read the, uh, the William James lectures at Edinburgh, 
and we was talking about uh, religious conversion experiences, and they all seemed to come at moments when people's lives were so bad that they kind of gave up, right? It's that suddenly you stop relying on your brain, and then something comes in. Does that make sense? Ed. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a lot of laughs tonight, Ed. What are you up to? I want to tell you uh, a bit about two parts of my own career in psychical research. And I, I've been in it since the early 1970s, but I've only been at DOP since 2003. And the kinds of things that I've been involved in uh, kind of bracket the main part of the DOP's research portfolio. You know, most of DOP's work has been focused on very detailed case studies and uh, field investigations of various kinds that you've heard about. Um, but I'm, like him, an experimental psychologist by training, and I actually uh, got started in this direction late in graduate school. Uh, because of some personal experiences, I encountered the literature of experimental uh, parapsychology and while I was working on my dissertation, read enough of it to become convinced that there really seemed to be something there. I mean, these people were using the same kind of methods that I was being taught to study uh, paranormal phenomena. Um, and uh, the other thing was that it was clear that if these things existed, it was extremely important because, I mean, the whole point about these phenomena is that they challenge widely held views about what's possible. You know, all of, we use a, a generic term, psi, for uh, things like ESP, extrasensory perception, which has several subcategories, psychokinesis, or mind over matter, direct influence on the environment, not using your motor system and all that. And the whole point of both kinds of phenomena is that a person or an organism is exchanging information with the environment despite the presence of some kind of a barrier that conventional classical physical principles would say should prevent that from happening. And it's very easy, it turns out, to set up experiments to test whether these things can happen. And of course, at that time, uh, the main center for experimental parapsychology in the US was Durham, North Carolina, where J.B. Ryan had set up a unit in the psych department at Duke. Uh, and so I began corresponding with Ryan and decided after a while that I'd throw caution to the wind. I had friends who were telling me, you're ruining your life here, but uh, nonetheless, I went down and I began working for Ryan at the usual, the usual terms, $400 a month, six month trial period. Um, a steady stream of uh, idealistic volunteers, most of whom didn't survive very long. Anyway, uh, I also had the great good fortune, uh, after I'd been there for about a month, a guy showed up who turned out to be probably one of the best subjects ever to walk into an experimental parapsychology laboratory. Uh, this guy could do essentially anything we asked him to do. I worked with him for over a year. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, uh, we had a special electronic psi testing machine. Uh, it, it involved, uh, you had four targets, four lights, the machine would pick one, you were supposed to guess which it would be. Uh, the machine, in the absence of a subject, uh, instantiated the laws of probability to perfection. Same with most persons, but the guy who built this thing had spent a couple of years looking for people who could do systematically better, had found a couple of people who could do a couple of percent better on demand. Okay, well this uh, new guy who came down, came into the uh, main meeting room of the Ryan lab, sat down with this machine, who was telling us his life story, he would occasionally reach over and push a button. And in the course of an hour, he had uh, over 35% hits in over 500 trials, which would happen something of that sort or better by chance, something like one in 10 million times. So we might have sat there for something like 10 million hours waiting for that to happen by chance. And the uh, inventor of the device's eyes were getting very big as this process wore on. Anyway, uh, the same person, I, I've seen him do as, as well as 50% on that machine for hundreds of trials at a time. He could also guess playing cards at something like three times the expected rate. 
uh, with large numbers of excess number hits as well. Uh, and there were things, well, let me just stop there and, and give you one of the, what I hope will be a primary take home point of this talk. Uh, these phenomena, these psi phenomena, in my opinion, and I'm talking now not just in terms of my personal experience with this guy, but the whole accumulated literature of case studies and experimental studies of which there are now thousands published in peer-reviewed journals. These phenomena exist as facts of nature and science is gonna to have to accommodate to their existence. It's gonna to have to expand in some way to accommodate them. Now, at that time, I, like most parapsychologists, I think, hoped that the changes would be kind of small. But as time has gone on, I've become more and more convinced that the changes are gonna to have to be much more radical than I had imagined at the beginning. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. But to uh, continue on with the experimental part, uh, one of the big things that happened during that period, I, wor I worked at the Rhine Lab for about a year and a half, uh, but then migrated over to uh, the Department of Electrical Engineering at Duke, the reason being that I had become convinced, particularly because of experiences with this guy, that it would be productive to st study uh, psi phenomena in a, from a psychobiological kind of point of view. And in particular, what we wanted to do was to measure brain waves while people like him were performing in these tasks in hopes of learning something about what state the brain was in when he was about to make a good guess. Because if we had that kind of information, we could do all sorts of useful things with it. And so we started this program and uh, went at it diligently for uh, almost 10 years, uh, poorly funded the whole time made enough progress to feel we were on a good track, but eventually the funds ran out and I had to uh, abandon ship, basically. Uh, started working in conventional neuroscience at UNC Chapel Hill. <laughs> All the enemies. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm happy to report that since coming here, together with some colleagues, we've managed to uh, create a really good uh, neuroimaging lab where we can do the kind of studies we could only dream about years ago. And one of the things I hope to do in, in talking to you is to encourage some bright undergraduates or early graduate students who are working in areas like psychology or neuroscience or biomedical engineering maybe to uh, come visit because uh, we can provide you with lots of interesting opportunities. And we're also interested, of course, in hearing about people who either have skills themselves or know people who do, because that's really the main obstacle to carrying this program forward, is finding people with the appropriate kinds of skills. Anyway, that's uh, maybe enough on that front. Now I'm <clears throat> gonna shift gears, and they're not here now, but the two books at the far end of the uh, book list there, uh, those were the major products of a project that went on for about 15 years through Esalen. John talked about it a little bit last night. That's where we met John, actually, in the early, early 2000s. Um, and I have to give you a little bit of background to this. And, and in talking about all this stuff, what I hope to do is to situate the work that we do at DOPS right at the center of a very big something that is just now taking shape. It's what I believe will prove to be a major inflection point in Western intellectual history. That's a big mouthful. Let me try to explain what I'm talking about. Um, the background to this whole project is that uh, a great majority of mainstream American scientists today, Western scientists really in general, particularly in areas like the behavioral sciences, psychology, neuroscience, and also areas like philosophy of mind, hold either explicitly or implicitly a view that's a kind of a modern, um, sanitized, philosophical version of what used to be called materialism in previous centuries. It's called physicalism now. And it's, uh, I mean, it comes in a lot of subtly different variants, but the, the basic common idea is pretty straightforward and easy to state. Uh, the basic idea is that all facts are determined in the end by physical facts alone. Reality consists at bottom of some kind of ultimate stuff, little bits of that stuff 
uh, flying around in fields of force in accordance with mathematical laws. Everything else has to come from that. We human beings are nothing more than exceedingly complicated biological machines. Everything in mind and consciousness is generated by physiological events and processes in our brains. It's an absolutely inescapable corollary of that picture, if it were true, that there cannot be any such thing as post-mortem survival. Because when you die, the machinery that generates you disappears. On a more cosmic scale, uh, people who hold these views see no sign of any kind of final causes or teleology in nature, nothing transcendental, no spiritual realm. The whole scheme of things is without meaning or purpose. And that's literally what probably 95% of mainstream scientists currently believe, at least while doing their day jobs. It's a bit surprising that uh, a sizable fraction, estimated on the order of 30 to 40 percent, also have some kind of a spiritual practice going, and how they reconcile these two things might be a little difficult. Um, anyway, um, Mike Murphy out at Esalen Institute was acutely aware of this, and he also was aware of various groups, including in particular us at DOPS, who uh, have been doing research on post-mortem survival and developing what appears to be evidence suggestive of its existence as a fact of nature. So he convened this group and uh, we began reviewing all this evidence and we gradually, the, the project kind of morphed. When we, we became convinced early on, we were all convinced that we are not physicalists and hatched this uh, plot to uh, destroy it and find something better to replace it with. Uh, so to summarize, <laughs> to summarize the whole process all too quickly, uh, we developed these two books. The first, and they're not there, they're, they're not showing up at the <laughs> exact moment. Anyway, Irreducible Mind was intended to be our version of an assault on physicalism. And in it, we basically pulled together from a wide variety of sources a whole lot of uh, empirical phenomena, well established, that we feel are difficult or in some cases absolutely impossible to explain in classical physical terms. You know, these psi phenomena and evidence of survival are right at the top of that list. But that's not the only, they are not the only things that point in this direction. A lot of mainstream scientists, of course they hate all this stuff, and hope that it can be sort of quarantined, put in a room somewhere by itself because we're succeeding at everything else and uh, therefore we can do that. But it's not true. Uh, there are plenty of phenomena, and we catalog a bunch of them in the irreducible mind, that are equally hard to explain, including things like uh, geometrically shaped hypnotic blisters. Emily has a great chapter on extreme physiological phenomena of that sort. Aspects of human memory that are totally unexplained at present, despite a huge literature about it. Um, one of, to me, one of the most uh, important parts of the evidence is the stuff that Bruce is working on, near-death experiences, and in particular those that occur under these extreme physiological conditions. We also talk about stuff like uh, extreme forms of genius and mystical experiences, which have been widely ignored by contemporary science, but which we argue cannot be ignored because they're telling us important things about how things are. Anyway, uh, just to summarize that whole exercise, and I have to tell you this book is like 830 pages long, so it's not easily summarized. Um, but uh, from a psychological point of view, the, the really crucial thing about it is, for me anyhow, it established as a viable possibility uh, a suggestion that William James had made over a century ago, talking about the uh, correlation, which everybody admits, between mental things and physical things, you know, we know you get hit on the head or drink too much and something mental changes. Uh, you might think, well, uh, I decide to raise my arm and the damn thing goes up in the air. Isn't that mental causation? Well, physicalist says you've just misunderstood because ideas in your mind are really just patterns of activity in your brain. Physical causes physical, no problem. Well, the way to uh, attack that point of view is to show things that cannot possibly be accomplished by the brain itself, and that's what irreducible mind tries to do. James pointed out that even though most 
uh, mainstream scientists interpret the correlations between mental and physical as evidence of their production point of view, mental produced by physical, period. You can think of it the other way, that the mental and the physical sort of coexist. The mind uh, operates in connection with the brain. The stuff in it is not produced by brain processes, but its activity is conditioned by the state of the brain. Uh, to me, the arguments and evidence that we develop in Irreducible Mind were sufficient to show that that point of view is viable and it totally changed my personal attitude towards survival. It provides an opening to overcome this biological objection to the possibility of survival. If the way the system really works is the way I described, that a mind can be something somehow independent of the brain, but operating together with it, I believe we can explain all the conventional evidence used by physicalists to support their point of view, and in addition, some of these things that we study at DOPS, just as James had argued over a century ago. Okay, well, that was stage one. That was the easy, that was the easy part. <laughs> I mean, it was just a huge clerical job, basically, to pull all this stuff together from a vastly dispersed, mostly biomedical literature. There's all kinds of stuff out there that challenges the physicalist point of view, but has never been really assembled in a way to show that clearly. Okay, but now comes the hard part. Uh, what can possibly replace the physicalist point of view? Ah, right on time. Beyond physicalism, that's part two. <laughs> that was published in 2015, and the basic strategy in, in trying to put that together was we looked around for a whole bunch of uh, systems that we had access to through our membership. So it's somewhat selective in that regard. But we specifically wanted to look at uh, people and systems that had deliberately tried to figure out how the world must have to be in order for the kinds of phenomena we had cataloged in Irreducible Mind could occur. Uh, we found quite a few of these things, uh, a very strange set of bedfellows for one book. We got chapters in there by several physicists, for example, contemporary physicists, quantum theorists, cosmologists. Um, several uh, um, from the, we had a big membership of scholars of religion uh, and some of the uh, old mystically informed uh, religious philosophical systems have also taken the existence of these phen phenomena for granted and tried to explain them. And there were several uh, Western philosophical traditions also, like uh, Leibniz, for example, and uh, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce and Alfred North Whitehead. So we pulled all these things together and tried to sort of interanimate them. And we have a, a final part of the book in which we try to figure out where is this all headed and the basic, what I want, want to convey to you is that even though we don't have any sort of final position that we're all agreed upon by any means, there is a definite central tendency of all this stuff. And it's a tendency toward what amounts to the exact opposite of contemporary physicalism, which takes the view that consciousness, far from being an ineffectual byproduct of things going on in the brain, is in fact at the source of everything and we're going to have to somehow figure out how our experience of ourselves as being in a shared external world comes into being. And I will tell you also that uh, at, at this very moment, I know of at least three books being generated by people who are deeply familiar with developments in modern physics, uh, all driven by mystical experiences of their own, who are attempting to formulate their particular systems of that sort. Uh, and I firmly, personally believe that something of this sort will emerge in the not distant future as the new sort of received wisdom, the new generally accepted scientifically based worldview. Uh, and I also would echo Kim in saying to uh, John that uh, this may be our best and perhaps only hope to uh, save ourselves from the various catastrophes yeah, you described last night. I agree with you. Thank you.
Let's, let's just take a few seconds for people who need to leave, who have planes to catch or children to punish. What are you up to, Pat? Pat? There's quite a lot of... Evan. All right. Uh, the very patient lady there, the front of the mic. Is it working? OK. Um, so. In my extremely imperfect understanding or dalliance at all in, in like Eastern philosophies, I've always thought of like um, communal consciousness as something that either pre-existed our corporal being and, and maybe existed afterwards. And maybe that's why babies do have that lack of a sense of separation between themselves and others that they then kind of grow into and get the ego and the ego kind of you know caps out somewhere in whatever, the 40s, 50s, and then towards death, the ego is, is dropped, and that's sort of, uh, from what I've understood, a lot of times with mindfulness and whatnot, uh, the key to um, avoiding psychic pain is, is the dropping of the ego. But a lot of what you've explained in the near-death experiences and other things seem to maintain a very individualistic existence post our bodies, and I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that, or do you think that that's almost because they're so close to a earthly life, or do you really, or do, and you, you sort of had, you gave an example of like a, a, a dialogue between two souls, or whatever you want to refer to them as. Is it a, in your minds, or maybe you think separately, is it a communal consciousness, or do you think it, it continues as a single standing consciousness? Thank you, this is a very complicated question. If, if you ask a near-death experiencer to, set, to tell you what happened in their experience, they will often start by saying, I can't put it into words. There are no words to explain this. You say, great, tell me about it. <laughs> so they force it into English words, knowing that it's a distortion to do that. So when they say, I saw my body, it's not like they were seeing with eyes. They knew where the body was. They knew things about the body. And the only way they can convey it to me is by saying, I saw it. So when they talk about personal things, we know they're using a metaphor to, to explain it to us. Many of them will say that in their near-death experience, there was kind of a dual consciousness. They were aware of themselves and also aware of being part of something much greater than themselves and they can't explain it to us because it doesn't go into English words. I, I think it's also true that there's a lot in the mystical literature about this, about people who have mystical experiences and retain that sense of self, but conversely are also losing that sense of self. And again, like, like the near-death experiencers say, they can't really explain it, although they try. But that, that sort of paradoxical maintaining and losing the sense of self that this happens in mystical experiences. Great. Oh, yes, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> that's very fair. <fun. laughs> what? Uh, do, do we, when do we have to finish? We have to finish in five minutes, so let's talk. Very, very fast. I'll be very quick. Uh, the children who remember previous lives, they obviously had adult skills in those lives, language, music, smells. Um, 
any of that carry through? Sometimes uh, there are cases where uh, children seem to learn things more quickly than other children do. There are occasional, very few, but occasional prodigy type cases. I, I've got one where a, um, it's a bit of a long story and we've only got five minutes, but he basically remembered being the life of, uh, uh, remembered the life as a golfer, a professional golfer, Bobby Jones, people may know. And this kid was definitely a golfing prodigy. I mean, from the age of three on, he was winning golf tournaments. So there do seem to be times where skills do carry over. Um, I have two things to say. One, I did have a, uh, I think it would be a mystical experience, you might say, and you and the blonde pretty girl. Um, <laughs> I, I want to say I do have a key because of the first 43 years of my life were a living hell. I couldn't figure out how to do life, um, so I, I lost my children. I did get them back, but I, I came to the end of myself. I didn't know what to do, and I said, fuck it. I don't care if there's a hell, I'll go there. I don't care because I can't do it anymore. So I had this uh, encounter, and I'm not going to tell you all of it. You can look on my website or whatever, but here's the key. Uh, the first thing I heard when I went into the trance on that day in, my own, in, my, in the house that I was being evicted from, when I went into the trance, the first thing I heard was because the guy told me I had to go to church, and I said, I've already tried that. And then he said, ma'am, you already know about God. And as soon, that's when I went into the trance, as soon as he said that. And then I went into the trance, and the very first thing I heard was going back to the altar, because he told me I had to go back to the altar. And the first thing I heard was going back to the altar means starting all over with everything that you think that you know about life. And I said, I won't know anything. I mean, I'll really be stupid, right? And, but there was this flutter of fairies around me going, yes, yes, yes. So I made an agreement that I would surrender everything that I thought that I knew that obviously wasn't working. Today, I'm a successful business owner, eight years in the home health care field, alive and healthy. And I have the keys to life. I know exactly what you're talking about, and for you, and here, the reason I'm up here, I didn't want to come up here, but I felt pushed, and I said, give me a sign, like, give me something bright yellow, because that's my favorite color, and I look around the room, and I see bright yellow in the light bulbs, which they're usually white, but these are bright yellow, so I said, I've got to come up, but here's for your fundraising. You're talking about, um, are they using drugs for people that are crossing over? Patient after patient, they all have an encounter before they cross over. So for your fundraising, I would say single, uh, find out people that own home care agencies, which I'm one, and let us give you a report for free so that you can know what these people are actually experiencing. Would you not say that that is a really good first-hand way of knowing? Because I, mean, I would it, never lie it's to a you. Very, it's a very good idea, and we have people here who will be able to follow that one up. Uh, you, sir, you have four seconds. Oh, madam. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on, and do you have any studies regarding mediumship? Mediumship? <clears throat> well, we, yes, I did a study of mediums um, several years ago. Um, I, I, since we have so little time, I won't go into any details about it. I did a study with um, a number of mediums. Did, we did sort of blind readings with the mediums. And again, I can't go into great details, but it was, it was one of the mediums in protector was, was, was extremely successful. And then um, Ed and Kim are now, they've got a proposal for a mediumship study to, to be done here um, also. So yes, we, we are interested in that, yeah. Last one, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cleese uh, Dobbs, thank you for this evening. My question is, in your research, have you run into any uh, cases with children in which they have taken on the personalities of the, of the past lives that they claim they had? Or like, as they have grown older, have they grown older, have they taken on those personalities? Well, um, it seems, with each case, we, we code it on a bunch of different variables and put it in the database, and that includes some personality features. And what we see is that 
there is a correlation between personality features in the previous person and the child. It's certainly not one-to-one. -one. I mean, they are different individuals, and of course we know personality is affected by genes and environment and everything else, but there is a, a correlation there. So it seems that there is, is um, some carryover, but it's also subject to be changed by the other aspects of life. Okay, well, that's, I just want to wrap this up with something I found. This also, this book, which uh, Dean Radin gave to me a couple of weeks ago, Real Magic. He just, at the end, he, uh, uh, sorry, at the beginning of the uh, chapter on scientific evidence, which seems to be really uh, the 101 of this stuff, um, he talks about a woman who was the chair of the statistics department at the University of California at Irvine. And in her presidential address to that, um, to the uh, ASA, uh, speaking at a meeting attended by 6,000 statisticians, she said something, uh, she said, for many years I've worked with researchers doing very careful work in parapsychology, including a year that I spent working full-time on a classified project for the United States government to see if we could use these abilities for intelligence gathering during the Cold War. And then she concludes, at the end of that project, I wrote a report for Congress stating what I still think is true. The data in support of precognition and possibly other related phenomena is quite strong statistically and would be widely accepted if it pertained to something more mundane. <laughs> I think that's really interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte Villains.